Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage Podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Here on the Aerospace Advantage Podcast, we speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and subject matter experts who explore the intersection between strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. Now to our regular listeners, thank you so much for coming back. And if it's your first time here, we really appreciate you joining us. This week, we're going to take a look at space operations from an allied perspective with Vice Air Marshal Harvey Smith of the Royal Air Force. He's the Director of Space UK at the Ministry of Defense. He was a key part of the team who recently released a white paper called Defense Space Strategy, Operationalizing the Space Domain. And this is a big deal because so much is changing in space right now, and the actions of one country ultimately impacts everyone else. And from a U.S. perspective, just like in every other domain, we really depend on our allies and partners for help to secure our goals. So that means it's important for us to understand where they're coming from, how they view this domain, and how they define their objectives. And we also have General Kevin Chilton, who is here with us for the conversation. As you know, he's the leader of Mitchell Institute Space Team, and his background in space is second to none, from that of an astronaut to a senior military commander. General Chilton, thank you so much for joining in today. Slick, it's great to be with you again, as always. Okay, without further delay, I'd like to welcome Air Vice Marshal Smith. Sir, thanks so much for joining us. Well, Slick, I thank you very much indeed. It's an absolute honor to be uh, asked to contribute to this discussion, especially as alongside someone as distinguished as uh, General Chilton here. In reality, having just listened to some of that introduction and having read his CV, I think it's me that should be asking all the questions. I'd love to learn more. But thank you again for having me. Air Vice Marshal Smith, uh, I think you sell yourself short here. Uh, <laughs> But if I could, I'd, I'd like to kick off by our chat today by uh, asking you how you and your team view space from a national security perspective now, and w- what are the primary missions that the UK seeks to achieve with assets on orbit? Thanks, General. You're very kind. Uh, so I think uh, if you could bear with me, it's probably worth a little bit of historical context from the UK perspective. I. Uh, because space has been an interesting journey for us over the years. We actually uh, started an extremely ambitious space program way back in the 1950s, almost alongside the U.S. and all the partners and a very close partnership then with the U.S. uh, launching our first satellite, which was called Ariel, uh, like the mermaid on a U.S. rocket uh, in the early 60s. And then subsequently, we had ambitions of our own launch program which culminated with the UK's Black Arrow rocket later that same decade. However, as we all experienced, particularly in nations, smaller nations, uh, as we went through the 70s and the strategic pressures of the Cold War, new priorities, funding pressures, etc., space programs were cut back quite dramatically. And apart from our strategic communications, uh, Skynet program, large, big old uh, double double-decker bus satellites out in geo, our military space, that, that effectively has been the backbone of our military space program since. And to a certain extent, our civil program as well has been extremely modest. So in re- reality, throughout the last few decades, we've relied quite heavily on our close relationship with the U.S. in terms of receiving U.S. space-derived data, uh, which is shared across our defense intelligence network and community and subsequently processed by our analysts, uh, working alongside U.S. partners like the NGA, etc., to produce intelligence products for key decision makers. Um, So I guess it's about two to three years ago within our Ministry of Defense here in London, there was a realization that this position was fast becoming untenable, especially in the fast-paced digital world where the criticality of the space domain has become all-encompassing. So not just in terms of being the key integrating domain for our armed forces and the national security agencies, but for everyday modern life. So in short, we in the UK realized that we did need to get more skin in the space game and we needed to do this quickly and definitely in concert with our uh, key allies and in particular the US. 
Uh, so with, this is a backdrop. In April 2020, about two years ago, uh, we stood up the Space Directorate within our Ministry of Defence here in London. And I have the immense privilege and somewhat challenge of being our first Director of Space. And I'm charged with hearing all of UK Defence's approach both in terms of developing and delivering a new and more ambitious defence space strategy and the associated defence space programme uh, that underpins that. I've also had to uh, start from a blank sheet of paper to find the new funding and lastly to do the analysis and deliver the argument, win the argument for the stand-up of what is now our new UK Space Commands. Um, and the idea of our Space Command is effectively to take on the heavy lifting of delivering everything that I've just mentioned, uh, implementing the strategy. So it's been a little bit of a roller coaster ride over the last uh, two years. But in fairness, we have achieved all of those tasks. And um, the strategy is published. We've got a new defense space program, which is agreed and more importantly funded over a 10-year profile. Um, and last year, we stood up UK Space Command. In fact, just last month, the command declared initial operating capability. So, so far, so good. Um, and I think in reality, the importance, we've had this success because the importance of the space domain has very firmly landed as a narrative, not just within defense, but across government. And really, this started with the watchword of integration. Uh, last year, we had a big defense review here in uh, in UK. And the, the kind of big idea that came out of that was our multi-domain uh, integration plan, which is akin to the US JADC2 effort. It's pretty much identical, just a, a different acronym. Um, so the narrative on space landed more broadly um, across government because of this need to use space to integrate properly across all the domains. In simple terms, we uh, developed a narrative that we called the four C's, and this really helped us uh, speak to people about space who uh, didn't necessarily have a solid background. So the four C's, C's were space is critical to modern life, um, and importantly for us in defence are the operational edge or the operational advantage that we enjoy, but it's also becoming much more contested, um, particularly by nations such as Russia and China. And alongside that, as many others populate space, it's becoming exponentially congested, both in terms of debris and the numbers of satellites we're seeing, particularly in low Earth orbit. And then lastly, and I think this is important to recognize, the fact that space is now competed in a new way. It's no longer just state on state, but we're sta seeing a uh, big commercial entities like SpaceX, uh, Blue Origin, etc., I really start to operate in space domain at a pace and with a risk appetite that definitely puts us in government or in public service on the back foot. So the four C's, it's critical, it's contested, it's congested and it's competed. They're just the baseline uh, foundation of that discussion really helped us to land space as something that people needed to be more alive to. Frankly, uh, until a couple of years ago, we were just paying lip service to it, if I was being really honest. Um, so what, what we're definitely seeing now is this idea of a second or a new space race. And there is a recognition in UK, uh, not just in defence, but again, across government, that this is a race which UK must be part of if we're to remain a major strategic player in the world going forward. So I guess, I guess with all of that as a quite an extensive backdrop, just to kind of give you a little bit of the detail, uh, where before it was just Skynet, strategic comms and geo, and that was kind of it with a few other little pet projects around the edges. Our new defense space program is attempting to broaden way beyond that, uh, looking at uh, developing new capabilities, ranging from the softer end, space training and education for our people, a more coherent space command and control, with the new and stand-up of UK Space Command, uh, capabilities to enhance our space domain awareness, uh, our own ISR constellation of small satellites based in LEO, 
um, a new space-based digital backbone and network to push all this data around at a time and place of our choosing that we call the speed of relevance, PNT resilience, and then a range of tunable space control measures, which you can imagine quickly becomes a classified discussion. Um, so there's a, a much broader, much more ambitious uh, aim point now over this next decade from where we were before. And like I said, we now have the ambition, we have the strategy all approved, we've got the plan, and importantly, we've got the funding. Not all the funding that we wanted, but enough to put the foundation in from which to step forward. And frankly, as I have briefed all the way into the Prime Minister, you know, this is a, a bottomless bucket of funding. I could spend the whole of the UK's GDP on space if we were so minded. Um, so we really do appreciate that. Yes, we've made great progress in the last couple of years, but we're only at the very start of a long journey. Um, we know we're a bit late to the party, but the ambition and the strategies there. Uh, and definitely key to that is how we move forward with our partnerships and, and with our allies. And throughout this two, two years, I must say, and it's not just because of the audience I've got here, but the discussions and the help and the support that I've had from my US colleagues has just been a uh, second to none. It's been absolutely exceptional and has really helped us leapfrog forward way further than I thought we could get to, um, which I enormously appreciate. Well, I'm I'm very impressed by that, Air Vice Marshal, and congratulations. And I'm reminded that the uh, US Space Force is just a bit over two years old. And I know General Jay Raymond had to do very much the same that you've done. And it's, it's difficult work. It's, it, there's a lot of spade work involved there, whether it be from just uh, personnel, organization to funding, as you pointed out. And so uh, congratulations for the distance you've come in such a short period of time from essentially a cold start, as you described. Yeah. So that, that's terrific. And, you, you, know, you know, you mentioned Russia and China and, and, and the contested part of your four C's there. And um, they, we've obviously seen them using both terrestrial and space-based assets. Uh, to hold our assets at risk on orbit. Um, it's totally changed the way we think about space operations, I think, in America, or at least it's brought to, to the forefront what people have been anticipating for many, many years. Um, are, are, are you having to navigate the same challenges on your side and perhaps some thoughts on how you're doing that? Uh, absolutely. Um, it's a great question and this is absolutely at the forefront of our mind and actually something that we've pushed very hard from a defence perspective because you can well imagine everyone's very interested in space. It's a, it's a cool topic to be involved with um, but many others tend to go straight to the technology uh, or the new equipments or indeed the prosperity agenda that this could underpin um, but we in defence have been uh, trying to stand very firmly with the threat-led discussion um, and that has really helped, uh, particularly as we brief up into the likes of Number 10 in the National Space Council, which the Prime Minister chairs. So, yes, very much so at the front of our mind. Um, and it won't at all surprise you that uh, we're completely aligned um, with all of the thinking that's, that's emanating from our like-minded partners, particularly the U.S., the UK, our approach to this has been uh, multifaceted, I would say. Firstly, you will be aware that UK, through our uh, State Department equivalent, our Foreign and Commonwealth Office, uh, we're leading an initiative into the UN to try and gain global consensus on what uh, are acceptable space norms of behaviour. Um, as we know, we're all... Um, witnessing at present that there, there are no real agreed accepted norms. We know there's the Outer Space Treaty, etc. But is that fit for question? Uh, is that fit for purpose? You know, question mark. Uh, many refer to uh, space as the Wild West, and we are seeing that uh, play out on some occasion, particularly with how others uh, do things like RPO, etc. Uh, so this affords. This kind of Wild West approach definitely affords various actors the ability to operate at all without any real recourse for being held to account. Um, so um, th this idea of trying to at least establish a baseline of what accepted norms should be and using the UN and the UN resolution to do that is really important. And we definitely saw this play out at the tail end of last year when Russia uh, launched a DA sat and uh, destroyed one of their satellites and created you know thousands of new pieces of debris in low Earth orbit. It even put at risk 
the International Space Station, which at the time had Russian cosmonauts on board. So the whole thing was just a little bit crazy. But really, how do you hold people to account on that if there's no accepted norms on it? Um, so we think on the soft power side, that's a really important piece of work uh, in terms of uh, where do we go forward with the threats that we see. On the capability front, uh, we have prioritized the deepening of our space domain awareness capabilities uh, to the point where we can confidently know exactly what is going on in space. So not just seeing something, but seeing it, knowing what it is, and knowing its intent across all of the orbital planes uh, to a level of fidelity that will allow us to attribute the actions of others and, and effectively call them right on it in the public domain and um, we know that we're not quite there yet and this for me isn't just about better higher fidelity radars and optical devices but it's about all of that data sharing across the like nations so that we can build layers and layers of awareness and a higher fidelity uh, let's call it a recognized space picture if you will and then lastly, of course, it is about the actual hard-edged capabilities in terms of space control so that if required, we can reach out and deliver effects to deny or deter um, the nefarious activities of others. And then lastly, and, and I guess I would say this working within a, a policy-led directorate here in our MOD, that's something that sometimes we overlook, but I think incredibly important is that all of that needs to be underpinned with the right uh, governmental approved policies, the rules of engagement, the targeting directives and the likes, much akin to what we would see across any of the other domains. The air domain, you know, my background, we're constantly discussing what are the, you know, what's the targeting directive, what's the air ops directive, What's the uh, what are the rules of engagement for this operation, and all of that work is absolutely required as we move forward with space, particularly if we are to defeat our potential adversaries and those potential threats that we see. That's a that's a very broad uh, description of the use of all elements of national power. I, I think that you've given us and highlighted the concerns that uh, I, I believe the U.S. shares as well. So thank you for that. If I could shift a little bit more to where the operational cooperation, um, I know I've experienced this throughout my career on active duty, uh, the frustration caused most often by uh, our side of the pond when it comes to sharing classified information. And uh, we have special protocols in place, certainly with our uh, allies and then even um, even more liberal ones, I'd say, with the Five Eyes partners. But even today, I still hear um, uh, folks on our side saying we overclassify things, mm -hmm. and, and which impedes our ability to work together. I, I was wondering if you could share um, any of your thoughts with regard to that and, and what more needs to be done and, and the importance of, of maybe dropping some of those barriers that we, that we are in total control of. It, it's, a, it's a hugely relevant point. Um, I think on the face of it, it's very easy to say that we'll all share and the collaborations and partnerships are really important. Um, but we all know, particularly those of us that have been on ops and high-end ops, high-tempo ops, the reality of sharing is sometimes and oftentimes stymied by process, policy and regulation. And of course, this obviously isn't unique to just the space domain. I definitely just in personal experience, I saw this play out practically every day um, when I was the CAIC director in Al Udaid in 2017-18, right at the height of the counter-ISIS campaign. And even with ISIS, which is a very clear adversary for us all, with a very clear end state of what we were aiming to achieve, it still was a daily grind to work through the multiple layers of uh, of the sharing mechanisms. So, um, yes, not easy, um, but that doesn't mean to say it's something that we shouldn't get after. I think... Um, you know, I've spent my career working very closely with the U.S. In previous life, I ran our F-35 program. I've worked on our carrier programs. I've worked in a, a lot of 
very highly classified areas where we share data and we have compartments and SAPs, etc. I think as an outsider looking in, particularly to the US space side, and this is not meant to be in any way disingenuous, but I would observe that for many decades, perhaps, the US space program has mostly been driven forward as a US eyes only endeavor. Um, so the, the kind of no foreign is the starting point for classification of data. Um, and then it was released for sharing on a case by case basis after that. Um, and it's not lost on me that the latest U.S. Space Force strategy, which we've just seen in the last few months, is absolutely laced with references to relationships and partnerships with allies. Um, in many ways, we see that as our asymmetric advantage over potential adversaries such as Russia or China, who themselves could and should find themselves alone against a broad global front of like-minded nations. And we most definitely see this play out at the moment with what we're observing in Ukraine, where effectively Russia's become a global pariah. So I think to make these partnerships really, truly work, we do need to be able to share and we need to be able to share at what we call the speed of relevance, sometimes easier said than done. Um, but the reality is we can't wait to rework the classification of material once we're actually in the fight. It's too late then. Um, then we're on the back foot. Then we're in reactive mode. This sharing needs to be done as ops normal. It needs to be our baseline, indeed, if, if we're truly to make partnerships work. So I think there needs to be a fundamental change in how material is classified specifically where we give our folks the wherewithal to be able to write for release from the very outset um, and then to classify further, almost to turn it on its head. Again, I know that's easier said than done, and I absolutely am not naive. I know there are capabilities and processes that we want to keep for eyes only. We're the same in the UK, this stuff that we have. Um, but if we're if if we're to make the partnerships properly work, we do need to get beyond it. I think what's really good news from what I see, and I have observed this with much uh, delight over the last certainly couple of years, is that the senior leadership in the US most definitely recognize that. I, I listened to General Raymond, General Dickinson, you know, brief on the multiple space conferences we have. And this is a topic that they always bring up. And this idea of shifting the paradigm away from no foreign to yes foreign. Again, it's a good catchphrase. It's easier said than done. But at least the discussion is there and the ambition is there from the top of shop. Um, the trick now is to give those at the desk officer level the, the tools to be able to do that and the confidence to do it. Um, I, I would just say I think one of the ways to do that is to practice it more in wargaming and exercising and to just have a go at it and see how all of our policies and permissions play out. You know, And if it's not right or if it's going too far, well, then we can dial it back in a controlled way or in, within a safe space. You know, in the likes of Schriever or maybe even the French Asterix war game, um, just to really test the boundaries of what we should and could share. And I think once we properly, meaningfully start to do that, all our people will start to see this idea of us being greater than the sum of the parts and the exponential benefit that we get, how we can more quickly outmaneuver our adversary, bring more to bear quickly. So I think the exercising in the war gaming is absolutely key. Getting the, getting the processes changed and then exercising and testing and adjusting against it. Well, I couldn't agree more with you. And I think, uh, you know, and your point about uh, senior leadership being sensitive to this, that I see that as well in my discussions with our senior leaders uh, in both the U.S. Space Force and and the uh, U.S. Space Command. Uh, it, there's frustration. Uh, and, you know, you, you see it in a briefing where a chart will come up and say eyes only. And, and the very first question is, why is that? Mm -hmm. And then it's that, that I think that top down and, and then, as you suggest, the exercises will you'll see the effects of, of the declassification of the sharing. And uh, that's I think that's couldn't agree more. That's the right way to go. So so we touched on some of the strategic themes earlier in your white paper, and one was um, protect and defend. And, uh, you know, with my background as Stratcom, we, we always looked at um, 
potential of conflict through the eyes of deterrence and, and our pr- preference to deter conflict uh, rather than to engage in it. And, and it's, it's, you know, it's a, a theory and a practice that's used in every other domain. And, and so no reason not to think about it in, in this domain of space, in my view, anyway. And generally, we, when we think of deterrence, we don't think of it as purely defensive or purely offensive, but a combination of both. And, I, and I'm wondering what your, your views are on that as, as we, we move forward into, as you say, a contested environment clearly is contested today, given behavior of the Chinese and the Russians. Yeah, excellent question. Very uh, opposites um, because it's a piece of work that we've just started here over the last year. You, you'll, uh, as you'd expect, I absolutely agree with you. And um, this piece of work that we've just started, which we're trying to do uh, alongside our uh, broader NATO colleagues, is kind of trying to properly flesh out the understanding of how space is used in this broader approach to integrated deterrence. Um, of course, we don't ever want to see a conflict begin in space, but we need to be ready for one should it occur. Um, I absolutely agree that this involves both capabilities that are terrestrial based and also those that are in space, both defensive and offensive. And from our uh, strategy and the analysis that we've done, I think this is a, well, firstly, definitely in alignment with the thinking that we're seeing coming out of the policy area for space in in the Pentagon. In fact, I I had a very good uh, discussion here in London just this morning with my uh, Pentagon counterpart. We were talking just about this. Um, So we would see these capabilities being coordinated and implemented across a broad partnership of like-minded allies, which which would then help bring both uh, breadth and depth to the approach critically. And I think this is something that with with a sensible partnership, the criticality of presenting resilience to a uh, to our potential adversaries, um, a resilience that they just simply won't possess. So we change the equation for them in terms of them knowing, well, we might go after that, but there's three other layers behind it, and that involves five other nations, and it's just not worth uh, the effort, either strategically or indeed tactically. I think as per all approaches, and I am no deterrence theory expert by any stretch, but um, and to, you know, to make things small, fighter pilot brain here, uh, we talk about the three C's of deterrence. So having the relative capabilities, proving the credibility that you will and can use them. And then lastly, which I think is really important and we don't always get right, is communicating to those that you wish to deter. So having the capability, the credibility and communicating it. Um, and I really do think that last point, that's where, just linking back to my last discussion, uh, doing exercising and wargaming and then communicating that to the world, doing these things in a certain way and we're achieving these types of effects. I know, oh, by the way, we're doing it with all of our friends across the globe. That in itself is a deterrence, um, a deterrence effect. Really important topic, um, very complicated made it even more complicated with language. And we're seeing this play out at the CSPO, at the Combined Space Ops Alliance, the Five Eyes plus France and Germany. Because when I say deterrence, I mean one thing. That means another thing in German, means a slightly different thing in French. And everyone's just trying to find the common ground uh, to navigate our way through that type of de- that type of discussion, particularly where over the years, rightly or wrongly, the word deterrence immediately becomes comes associated with nuclear and obviously then that throws up connotations with partners like for example New Zealand who have a certain view on on nuclear policy um, so not easy quite complicated but definitely important work to take forward uh, I'm reminded of my wife who always says whenever you hear a fighter pilot begin a conversation by saying I'm just a simple fighter pilot you better sharpen your pencil because stand by <laughs> so great uh, summary there of the, the the essence of deterrence and uh, it, it sounds very much like what uh, at least many communities over on in the U.S. are talking about what is necessary to go far do you see any um, conflict between that and our, our earlier discussion on a desire for norms of behavior 
I mean, some would argue, we, well, maybe a normal behavior is you don't weaponize space, but I would point out we don't do that in any other domain. Right. That's that's the challenge, isn't it? You uh, you need there's two sides to this coin. Of course, the safest way to not have a conflict is to have an agreement that no one has any weapons or hard edge capability. We all know that we don't live in that utopian world. So I think this is about having a breadth of capability. Um, it's about having a system of systems approach, and it's about understanding where your red lines are and what your trip points are. Um, and again, that comes back to my point earlier, which might be rather boring, but that it's all about the policy, getting the politicians and the senior decision makers lined up, not just within our own government, but across our alliances so that we know where is my red line on this? And once we're beyond that red line, that then unlocks these other capabilities that I am willing, I have the credibility and have communicated that I will use, um, which kind of, you know, that's why I, I uh, consider this to be quite a complicated and complex uh, discussion. Right. So so it's not an either or. Uh, you can have Absolutely. normal behavior as yep. we do in, in the air, land and sea domains. Yep. Yep. And yet at the same time, uh, posture for deterrence and, uh, and should that fail, fail victory. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's good to hear your views on that. Uh, but of course, if you're going to have norms of behavior, uh, it would be nice if you were able to observe when someone's violating those, which brings us back to um, space domain awareness. And that, again, another important part of your, your paper, uh, you've referred to it already. And I, we talked a little bit about filing sale. Could you, could you, is there other things that you're looking at to enhance um, your ability to surveil and attribute in the domain that in the past classically we just cataloged, but now we need to understand intent? Absolutely. Um, and again, it won't surprise you if, if it was the new UK Commander Space Command sat here, he'd be telling you that he's being directed to make space domain awareness his number one priority in terms of new capability deliveries. So our view is that before we can do anything, um, just like any other domain, before we can make any decision or uh, take any action, then we need to meaningfully understand the domain within which we're working. There's a really good analogy here, if you can bear with me for a moment, that we use to land the narrative on why space domain awareness is really important. Because what's interesting here is this point to Ryan, you know, space domain awareness tends to be radars on Earth or sharing data and building pictures through networks. It's not necessarily the sexy end of space, you know, rockets, astronauts, satellites. So sometimes it doesn't get the airtime. It's hard for a politician to stand beside a space to be in awareness and have a, you know, a nice picture taken or, you know, so we do have to work quite hard to really land, this is why space domain awareness is important. So this analogy that we've used here is, you, you may be aware, just in recent years, we've re-established our new carrier strike group capability through the Queen Elizabeth class carrier. I've been intimately involved with that and, and our F-35 program. So last year, we conducted what was called carrier strike group 21, where we sailed the whole of the carrier strike group and frankly, the world's biggest maritime-born fifth-generation air wing, us and our U.S. Marine Corps squadron of F-35Bs. Uh, and we went all the way through the meds across the Indian Ocean and into the South China Sea. I can tell you now from personal experience that was that entity's worth about five to six billion pounds. It's a strategic asset for the U.K., and the amount of intelligence and analysis and our understanding of that area of responsibility, the threat area that we put that CSG into, there practically wasn't anything that we didn't know. Uh, we knew where the risk was, what the threat was, what the combat indicators would be, what our reactions to those would be, our mitigation plans, everything. Then on the other hand, isn't it strange that we're very happy to take our Skynet program, which is worth five to six billion pounds, strategically important to UK because it gives us so sovereign global communications, and we'll send it 36,000 kilometers away to Geo, and then we just walk away. And we don't really know what's going on right there. And that may have been okay for recent decades where it was generally a fairly 
benign environments. But as we all know, those those days are long gone. Um, and we're seeing more and more nefarious activity, particularly all the way out to geo. Um, and just using that analogy has really helped us to uh, to explain to those that don't live and breathe space why it's really important to have space domain awareness. So um, with all of that in the background, um, SDA is indeed a core function of the UK Space Command as it's stood up now, sharing data from across a broad range of inputs, partners and allies, also the commercial uh, worlds to help build a solid recognised space picture. Um, secondly, we're working with allies on programmes such as DARK. You may be aware of DARK, the Deep Space Advanced Radar capability that we're working with the potential to have one of those DARK sites here in the United Kingdom to help help increase our ability for high fidelity uh, surveillance all the way out to geo and beyond. And then lastly, uh, we're working through all of the policies and all of the regulations and the legislation across government that will allow us to A, share the data that we have and share it in a meaningful way so that we can build a richer picture and B, lay out what our reactions will be should we see certain things happening, like a potential adversary satellite maneuvering close to one of our strategic satellites without any communication with us. What's our policy on that once we see it? And how do we call that out in a way that we can actually help to deter it or indeed react to it in the right manner? So again, it's a it's a layered approach and Yes, we need the hard edge capabilities, but we equally need that softer side of sharing the data and having policies in place so that SDA is actually what it says. It's domain awareness, and we understand the broader nuances of that, like the intent of the adversary. Terrific. And, you know, and I, I like to remind folks that uh, geography matters when it comes to space domain or awareness and and the UK is, has a, an advantageous location on the globe at a high latitude uh, yeah. to really be a, a huge contributor to uh, the broader domain awareness among the alliance so uh, that's that's terrific okay general and air vice marshal it's been a fascinating discussion so far and I don't want to interrupt you but air vice marshal I've got to ask you this um, you've walked us through your thoughts on space and the way the UK is approaching the domain but but could you talk to us specifically about the UK Space Command? What are the roles and responsibilities of the organization and how does it tie to the rest of the UK's military structure? Uh, so UK Space Command in essence is what I call the day-to-day -day heavy lifter for defense space. Um, so it's a two-star led joint command. It's hosted by the Royal Air Force, so it sits under the RAF for its kind of uh, life support as it were but it's UK Space Command delivering space for UK defence. Um, at present, the plan is to populate the workforce on a 70% Air Force, 15 Army, 15 Navy. Uh, but also we've got uh, a seam of civil servants and actual civilian contractors throughout the command. At the moment, the command has about 450 to 500 people in it. And we aspire to grow it to be about twice that size through the back end of this decade. It's got three key deliverables, none of which should surprise you. One is uh, the day-to-day -day operations of space. So space domain awareness, coordinate, coordinating conjunction analysis, all that kind of business that you would see in any space operations center. So day-to-day -day space ops, space training and education, not just for those that are going to be space ninjas working in space commands, but for the broader uh, population of defense, just trying to raise, uh, raise the awareness of space, particularly the criticality of it. And then lastly, the area that is most challenging but most important is they have the delegation on the funding and the new capability programs to go from capability development, so new nascent programs through capability delivery and then the pull through all the way to the operator. So the uh, the command has um, those three functions, 
I think one of the best things that the command has done in the last year is send out space LNOs across the whole of UK defence. So there's a sprinkling of them through the other services within our special ops group uh, into our strategic headquarters and our operational headquarters. Uh, we even have a space LNO now lodged permanently within the carrier strike group. And that's really starting to inculcate space as a planning consideration, regardless if you're sat in the four-star army headquarters. There's a space person at the table making sure space is part of the discussion. So that's been a, that's been a really good uh, initiative. Um, and now we're just in the process. Obviously, we've got about 30 Brits, again, sprinkled across the breadth of the U.S. space enterprise from Space Force, Space Command, SSC, we're in the NRO, the NGA, pretty much everywhere you go, there'll be a pesky Brit somewhere hiding in the background, uh, like we do. Um, and we're just in early conversation with other allies, such as Australia and Canada. Uh, we've got uh, plans to put someone into the new Centre of Excellence in Toulouse for NATO, and it's the Space Ops Centre at Ramstein for NATO again, so really just trying to get our tentacles out there whilst having right core back in the UK. Um, so all told, Space Command sits on those three pillars, ops, training and capability. It's definitely in the foothills. We still have a long way to go, particularly in growing the expertise on the space capability and the programming side. That's been a little bit slower than we'd hoped, and that's hindering us from delivering some of our aspirations in terms of capability. We're leveraging that uh, by bringing in people from the space sector and by partnering particularly with the U.S., um, and particularly into the new Space Systems Command, who, again, have been incredibly supportive throughout my last point would just be, you know, two years ago, we didn't even really know this journey existed. Now we know the journey. We, we can kind of see the road ahead. It's meandering. It goes off, disappears off into the distance. Um, but at least now we've got the tools to help navigate the journey. Um, but the journey's still ahead of us. That, that would be the way I would try to kind of uh, just capture it. And it seems like uh, a lot of this is based on just experience in other domains uh, and you, you know where, where you need to be uh, going forward. Um, I'll share one of the frustrations I had as the commander of Space Command and then U.S. Space Command. It was at the training level. And, you know, it was clear that our operators that, that were operating at the tactical level on console and then at the operational level in the Space Operations Center, they had, they had no training tools. Whenever we exercised or played war games, they, oftentimes they couldn't participate because they were doing real-world operations. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering, and, and let alone a red flag type scenario that uh, you're well familiar with in, in your fighter pilot days. Uh, how is the UK thinking about um, this aspect of preparing your guardian equivalent for um, the future uh, that we're all now right in the middle of? Yeah, hugely, hugely relevant question. Um, and as I've mentioned before, I do think the war game and the ex exercising together, you know, they really do help you flush out all the pinch points. You understand where the synergies lie, where the frictions are, and then help you put the right, you know, plans in place to work through all of that. So it is absolutely critical. Um, to me, it's the training tends to be the last thing we think about. Or we bought some kit. We've got some people, oh, did anybody train them to use it? And then they just kind of muddle their way through. Now, sometimes that's good. You know, we've got very bright people in our service, as you have, and they do tend to sometimes get their hands on this equipment and all of a sudden they're doing things with it that us old folk never ever imagined it could be used for. So that kind of early experimentation is good. But I do think, importantly, the, uh, the exercising is key. And I think more so in the space domain than any of the others, there's a real opportunity for us to use um, you know, new technology to really get after this, this idea of working in the virtual space. Um, you know, I know we've done things like virtual flag and the likes, and I've taken part in a few virtual flags. Um, but, you know, at some point you need to get in an airplane and pull 9G. 
or shoot a missile. In the space domain, it's slightly different. And even in the real world, when they're doing real world ops, it's got a sense of it being virtual anyway. These things are all happening so far away. People are working keyboards. They're working in an ops center and coordinating that way. And I really do think we could do a hell of a lot more with vir- virtual environments. You know, I think there's a ton to be learned from the gaming industry on this, where you know we can have really, really high fidelity modeling and properly flesh out some of the, you know, scenarios that you'd really rather not think about. But at least you could do it in a safe space to really see, um, are we are we getting after this in the right way? Are all of our allies able to come with us? Do our capabilities deliver the way we said they would? And even even doing it at the unclassified level, I think, would give us some goodness. So uh, for sure, and I recently went out to Shriver and, I was at the DV day for a space flag, and it was amazing. It was really good. It wasn't a red flag, but it, it was really good to see the Young Guardians and kind of our equivalents work through some really quite complex and crunchy problems. But I would observe that, you know, here we are in a 21st century next, dig, next generation digital world, and they were doing it all with uh, dry markers on whiteboards. You know, and, and we are still in that place. And I think there's a leap to be made here. And we could really be using technology in the digital domain, digital modeling, digital twinning, et cetera, to really take us to the next level of our exercising and war gaming. It's very, very important. Sir, here's another one for you. What's the UK public's attitude towards national security space? I think we're making progress in the US, uh, helping people understand that it's a contested domain, but it takes a lot of education. So uh, how do you view things on your end? And has the war in Ukraine impacted public uh, sentiment in this lane? It's a brilliant question um, and something we struggle with. Um, educating the public on why space is so important to them, you know, just the layman on the street, the, the chap you know, driving a digger on the local building site. Why convincing him that we need to take tens of billions of pounds worth of taxpayers' money and spend it on space um, is a tough one when particularly as we see the uh, manifestations of Ukraine, you know, petrol prices going up, electricity bills going up. You know, why are we spending 10 billion on space when I can't afford to put fuel in my car? It's, it's that, that is a tough a conversation to have. Um, so we are con- on a constant messaging campaign here, and it's around this idea that space is critical to everyday life. You know, if you want to do contactless payments, if you want the traffic lights to turn green at the right time, if you don't want airplanes to crash into each other over Heathrow, you know, all of this telemedicine, your uh, grocery delivery that you've do- ordered online, all of this is hooked through space. You pull your phone out and want to navigate through London. So you don't have to have one of those stupid A to Z things that I carried around when I was a teenager. And you just can easily find your way to the pub, which is strategically important to every person. Then, of course, you're linked to space. You've got to pay attention to this. Um, and we are on a big we're on a big campaign here. I think it, what's, what's interesting in the Royal Air Force, you know, we're. I think every domain's the same. They're all looking for a narrative around why are we important? Why do we? Why? Why should we uh, have your public money, your taxpayers' money? In the Royal Air Force, we've got this thing called the Battle of Britain, which we consistently hook to. We, all our kids are taught about the Battle of Britain when they're at school. This historically important reference point in our history. So anyone says, well, what do we need an Air Force? You go, you have heard of the Battle of Britain. You know, anybody wants to invade the country, the Air Force will be here to save the country for you. We did it before and we'll do it again. We don't, we don't have that narrative for space. It's kind of out of sight, out of mind. So it makes it really hard, which means you have to be consistently messaging. And it's one of those... You need to talk about it until you're boring yourself and only then are you starting to make an inroad, you know, and we do see that. And for what it's worth, I think the U.S. Space Force have really turned a corner on this as an outsider looking into that. I think uh, some of the advertisements they've been putting out on U.S. TV are just phenomenal. I think General Raymond's 30-second advertisement on space is hard you know at the end of that i was like sign me up when can i join the u.s space force it was absolutely as we would say in the uk bloody brilliant so you know we need that we need a little bit more of that i think we could be a bit bolder in the uk to get ourselves out there um 
Um, and we can definitely, definitely learn from where the U.S. Space Force is going for sure. It's really important, really important. If we don't have the public backing, then we'll fail. Well, Air Vice Marshal Smith, we're getting toward the end of our time block. This has been a, a great, great discussion. Great to hear your views. But uh, if I could toss you just one more question here. If, if we were to have this conversation again in 10 years' time, uh, what sort of UK space enterprise would you like to see in action? And perhaps a few thoughts on uh, the relationship between uh, the US and the UK uh, 10 years on. So um, when I started this job, as I, I think I've mentioned, I, I came pretty cold to space. I, I hadn't worked in space much before. I came in at the end of my first week, I got summoned by the prime minister's outer office to come across to number 10 and give them a brief on oh you're the new director of space can you come and tell us what the space program is and importantly the pm's really interested to know what will our space program look like in 2030 so in about 15 minutes on a whiteboard we pulled together one powerpoint slide of what we thought that could be um, no, this was as much about I need money, you need to give me money uh, to be able to do all, all of this. Uh, and it would be nice if that conversation was billions with a B money, then that would be a good starting point. Um, but interestingly, that so that's two years ago, it was a bit of a cartoon effort. But here we are post that with a strategy and a plan and new money and a space command. And actually, that single PowerPoint slide, I still brief it in my presentations because it has stood the test of time. Um, so I don't know if that was a really good lucky guess or some insightful new fresh pair of eyes to the domain that was like, well, this is easy, isn't it? Look, this is what it should be. But ultimately, it's this idea of us being having a much broader approach where before we kind of all eggs in this basket of satellite communications and then we'll just rely on our very close relationship with the U.S. for everything else. Um, we do have a 10-year plan that's now profiled out in monetary terms all the way to early the next decade. And in big handfuls, that says things like we'll be technology-led, we will use agile acquisition techniques to deliver a pace so that we stay in lockstep with the, uh, with the space sector, which we know is moving quickly. It'll concentrate on uh, new capabilities such as high Fidelity Space Domain Awareness, Globally Assured SATCOM, Multi-Role, Multi-Spectral ISR, particularly exploiting the LEO uh, uh, proliferation that we're seeing at the moment, um, and that we will have our own sovereign space control capabilities, tunable space control capabilities. All of that that sits on this foundation of a uh, space expertise that's properly trained and educated um, and that has a, a proper governance around it in terms of command and control. And, and most of that, uh, as I'm sure you can imagine, is at, right at the heart of the idea of uh, having a new UK space commands. There are also some links there to this being the beating heart of what our multi-domain integration will be. That's still an early journey. But key to all of that, and I remember in this PowerPoint slide, we'd kind of drawn drawn some ideas and then we had these cross-cutting themes, training and education, multi-domain integration, and then the absolute fundamental baseline foundation to this whole thing, it just said partners and allies. And that was absolutely key to this because we are under no illusion that we can do this on our own. And as I mentioned right at the start, particularly our very close relationship with the U.S., um, has just really helped us to accelerate forward. And, of course, when I say to my U.S. colleagues, well, what's in this for you? You know, why are you helping me so much? Um, you know, the answer is we need you as a key ally to advance these capabilities so that you can bring it to the table and we can have more resilience and have a, a proper a proper meaningful coalition of capability. Um, so, of course, there's something in it for the other side, but certainly I feel like it's a little bit of a one way at the moment. We're a little bit on the tech, 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 hopefully in due course. The big thing for me is that by 2030, we would have a UK space enterprise that was actually giving as well. And when we sat at the table, 
we were sitting at the table because we were contributing something meaningful to the space enterprise and that we weren't just there because the Brits always come to a coalition with the US. We're actually there because we've got a space enterprise and there's something meaningful to share. If we can deliver that and we can do it in a collaborative way, then we'll have had a big success. Well, I have no doubt that is the future because uh, that has been the history. Uh, of our collaboration together as allies in every other domain. And there's no reason why that won't mature and strengthen our our resolve and our capabilities going forward. So uh, that's a a brilliant, as you would say, uh, vision for the future. And so I appreciate that. And I I really appreciate this opportunity to spend time with you. I know, Slick, you'll close us out here, and I know you did as well. But uh, I want you to know there's always an open invitation at MI Space and the Mitchell Institute at large to to uh, give you a forum to share your ideas and uh, hopefully next time it won't be virtual. I look to look forward to doing it over a pint of Guinness and then we can really solve some problems. I agree, so I completely you know agree, General. That's the way to do business. So th- thank you again, Air Vice Marshal Smith, for your time. Thanks, General Chilton and Air Vice Marshal Smith. Really appreciate the both of you joining us. Always my pleasure, Slick. No, thanks. I've, I've really enjoyed it. I know I've uh, talked a lot and perhaps taken you over what would be your normal time scale. But um, as I mentioned, this is really important for us in the UK and I'm incredibly passionate about it. So having these discussions and being part of the debate and making sure that you know, people that listen to this properly understand where the UK the UK's mind is at and where we move forward with space is very important. So thank you for the opportunity and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.